So we're going to go through the notes here relatively quickly. A few videos I want to show you along the way and stuff, but um, we got to get through the basics first. So we know when we started talking on Friday about how species change over time. Okay? And we're going to continue talking about it today. The process that Darwin um, described in his research he called natural selection. So the name natural selection, basically what it means is nature chooses which organisms survive and which do not. And that selection is based on how well they can live in their ecosystem, in their environment. Sometimes this is called survival of the fittest. You heard that term? Yeah. Survival of the, what does fit mean? Now, not like fit, like physically fit, like myself, but fit in a different means. What does fit mean in this case? Yeah? Um, smart, like aware of the surroundings. Sometimes. Just like David? The most, yeah, like the best animal species that like has adapted to. Okay, good. So, does survival of the mid fittest mean survival of the strongest? Sometimes. The fastest? Sometimes. The most camouflage? Yeah. Sometimes. The brightest? Yeah. Sometimes. So yeah, all those things can be survival of the fittest. It's not the strongest, the fastest, the smartest. It just depends on what conditions there are and which traits are best. Like uh, Brady said, the best adapted is the best way to say this. So any individual that happens to be born that's well adapted, well suited to its environment will be more likely to survive, therefore more likely to reproduce, and more likely to pass on these beneficial traits to their offspring. Any individuals that are born with traits that make them not well adapted generally die before reproducing and will not pass on those traits to their offspring. And so if this continues generation after generation, it can result over time in a change in a species. And the beneficial traits become more common through time. And that can lead to the evolution of a species. And evolution is why we have such huge diversity of life on Earth. Because we have so many different varieties of habitats and conditions, species have evolved to fit those conditions. No, because if they don't reproduce, they don't pass on their genes to the next generation. Yeah, but if they're like, they're not like, uh, the best. If they're not well adapted, they just don't. So I don't know if it's better or worse, but they just don't pass on those genes. When we talk about natural selection, we sort of say there's sort of four steps to it. You have to start with variation. What does that word mean? David? Yeah, it means differences. Is there a lot of variation in height yeah. for you guys in this class? Of course. There's lots of variation in hair color and eye color. Okay? Those are variations. Okay? And all living things vary. Now we can perceive variation amongst ourselves very easily. We look around the room and say, of course, everybody in here is very different from each other. But all species are like that. You may think Squirrels are all like identical, like you can't tell them apart, one squirrel from another. But they have just as much variation as we do, but we're not squirrels and we don't perceive that very well. Okay? We probably look all identical to squirrels. Okay? But we know we all have variation. Every individual is unique. For example, here we see some grizzly bears. What's the variation that's obvious in this picture? The color, of their fur. color of their fur. Okay, they have different colors. Fur. It's just a natural variation that is present. Or in these um, ladybugs, okay. you see some obvious variation in spots, size of spots, color. Okay. And sometimes a variation 
that an organism happens to be born with is helpful in some way. Other times it might be harmful in some way. Other times it doesn't really matter either way. So here we see this variation in these ladybugs. Now, the important factor, we said, can an individual adapt or evolve? Yes. Species, populations, groups of organisms can adapt and evolve. This ladybug, can it evolve to have dark spots? No. No, no it's born like that, it's going to die like that. So that individual ladybug can't adapt to its conditions. This bear cannot just change its fur color to a darker color in some way. It's born with this color fur, and that's not going to change. So that's why we say individuals don't evolve. Individuals don't adapt over time. It's the species as a whole that does. So we have these variations. And we also know in nature there is a constant struggle for survival. competition for many things. There's competition to get enough food to survive, to find a mate, to find a living space, to avoid predators. Right? There's all these different factors that go into the survival of one individual. There's often limited resources, limited food, limited homes, there's predators. And the reality is not all organisms are going to survive. One fish, for example, can lay hundreds of thousands of eggs. Could they all survive into adulthood? No, only a tiny percent actually do. A huge percent are never even fertilized. Another large portion are eaten by predators. Another portion wash down the stream and don't develop. Right? There's only a small subset of those fish eggs that are going to grow, hatch, develop, and eventually become adults. So like Nemo? That's yeah. what I was going to say. Which ones do make it to adulthood? The ones that the fittest. The fittest. The ones that are adapted. best adapted to whatever conditions they are living in. They are the ones that survive. And if they can survive, that leads us into our next step, which is reproduction. Individuals that can survive are then more likely to reproduce. And in reproducing, they pass on their traits to the next generation. What were their traits like? If they survived, they were good traits. They were helpful traits. They're more likely to pass those on to the next generation. If you repeat this process hundreds, thousands, millions of times, this survival of certain individuals, reproduction, over time it leads to changes in the species. It leads to what we call adaptation. So when we say those saddleback tortoises are adapted to certain Galapagos Islands. We mean that over a long period of time, this process happened over and over again in little tiny changes. Doesn't mean you have to go from having um, a regular tortoise shell to the saddleback shell in one generation. That happens slowly. Maybe there's just a slight little bump in that tortoise shell. And it makes that tortoise that was happened to be born with it a little bit more likely to survive. And it's a little bit more likely to reproduce. Passes on that little bump to its offspring. When you repeat that over and over and over again, it can actually lead to major changes in the species, adaptation. And that's, we call these traits that help a species be successful, we call them adaptations. And over time, they increase in frequency in the population until eventually all, all members of the population have that. So what do we 
see here? Let's look at sort of our steps of natural selection. So what's the variation that we see in the population of these insects? What variations do we see? Henry? Um, color. Color. What else? Size? Yep. Anything else? Species. Place. Um, I don't know. They might all be the same species. Let's say they are. Place. The eye color? But yeah. the leaf isn't. No, okay. I'm just talking about the insects. Oh, oh, oh. All right. So that's the variation. So what is the struggle for survival that's being shown? Dan? That is a brown one. So what what is the struggle though amongst the insects? Which ones? Yeah, there is a predator. Okay, and more likely the brown ones, which don't blend in very well, are going to be more likely to be eaten. The smaller ones maybe, the green ones will be less likely, and therefore they're going to be less likely to be eaten, more likely to survive, more likely to reproduce. When they have little baby insects, what are they going to be like? Green. Green. Okay. Maybe some will be brown, but because there's that natural variation. Well, what happens to the brown ones? They, they get eaten. And so over a period of time, what may happen is this entire species of insects may evolve to be green in color. So survival of the fittest means that the organism that's most successful in its ecosystem will survive and have offspring. And those offspring will resemble the parent. Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but rather the ones that are most adaptable to change. So that leads us to this question about, well, why are we all different from each other? There's a couple important reasons. Where there's a couple um, things that contribute to this variation okay, that we have. First is sexual reproduction. There's much more variation in organisms that reproduce sexually than those that reproduce asexually. Asexual reproduction, what are the offspring like? Like the It's kind of like a copy. So there's not much variation introduced. However, in sexual reproduction, we have the mixing of genes of DNA from two separate parents, resulting in a new combination in the offspring. So sexual reproduction results in much more variation. But there's also another factor, mutations. You know what a mutation is? It's not what you're thinking about from cartoons, superhero movies. Doesn't give you green skin or turn a little turtle into a ninja. Um, sorry. Mutations are changes to the DNA of an organism. Kind of like mistakes when the DNA is being copied. And a change in the DNA can result in a change in the characteristics of an organism. And sometimes those traits are helpful. Sometimes they could be harmful. Sometimes they may not matter either way. These little changes are sort of um, the fuel for natural selection. So if all squirrels were exactly the same in every way, would there be any natural selection? No, because they would just sort of live and die randomly if they're all I completely identical to each other. Okay? And they would not evolve over time. But they're not all identical to each other. No species is. There's always some natural variation. Watch this video in a few minutes. One interesting, we have lots of interesting examples of natural selection that we'll talk about. One is the pea fowl. So, Y'all have probably been to the Utica Zoo. Do you ever see the peacocks walking around there? Yeah. Those are the males that you would see usually. Um, the female is called the pea hen. Um, do you ever see them walking around? No. They don't look, they're not as showy. They don't have this very large tail. Okay. Um, 
And what's the reason for the large, showy, colorful tail of a peacock? Bill? Yeah, it's a, a trait that helps it to attract mates. Female peafowls choose a mate based on their tail display, based on the color of the feathers, the size. The more impressive the tail, the higher its chances of doing what? Reproducing. Mating. Making a baby. Finding true love. And so because females kept choosing the brightest males, what happens to the males that maybe were born with some variation that gives them no color in their tail? True? They get rejected. They get rejected. Yeah. So this is not so much about survival. So it's not that those ones that maybe were born with boring tails don't survive, but it's the fact that they don't what? Reproduce. They don't find it. So the large, colorful tails were selected for, and the smaller tails were selected against throughout this process. This is actually sort of a subset of natural selection. It's called sexual selection. Sexual selection is when species evolve not based on survival, but on reproduction. You see this in lots of species. You know, male or ducks? Are you familiar with them? What does a male, male or duck look like? David? Kind of like brownish, and it has like big feet. Yeah, how about? It has a green head. A green head, oh, like that's blue stripe in its wing, pretty colorful. Do you know what the female male looks like? Uh, it's like brown and gray and like spotted. Not nearly as colorful as the male. A male robin has a bright um, orange breast feather. Female, much more boring. A male cardinal, bright red. Female cardinal, not nearly as bright. You see this all the time. Okay? These are because it's a result of sexual selection. Often, females choose a male based on their coloration. And females, however, they are adapted to being more hidden because they're often taking care of the eggs or the young. And so it's better for them to be this sort of boring color. So like, um, most, like, most species have a... A lot of species do. Not, yeah. All right. So any variation that is selected for we, will become abundant in the population, will become common. And any variation selected against will become rare. And so... The individuals most likely to survive are those with the best characteristics that are most helpful. And it varies from environment to environment. Darwin noticed this when he was traveling on the Beagle through the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands, we said, where? They're off the coast of where? South America. South America. It's a series of islands, some large, some small with lots of different wildlife present. And Darwin there noticed, he, he took this note of the um, finches that live there. Finches are small bird. And what Darwin noticed is that each finch species on the different islands had a beak that was very well adapted to whatever food source there was on that specific island. Other than their beaks, the birds look very similar to each other. Okay. They had all evolved from one original finch species that had made its way to the island, islands, okay? um, moved on to the various islands. But then once on those islands, each finch species started taking a different path because there were different conditions, different foods available. And this was a great example of natural selection that Darwin saw. Here's an example. These are what the finches look like. You have some finches which live on islands with lots of fruit, and they have that kind of beak. Some thick, large seeds that they have to break open with a really thick beak. Some eat smaller seeds. Some finches eat insects. Some 
some large insects, some in cactus, but each of them has a beak that's well suited to whatever food is there. So this is one of the things that helps Darwin start to understand and think about natural selection. And natural selection is important to us even in our everyday life. Probably most of you have had um, an ear infection or strep throat sometime in your life. What causes strep throat? Bill? Bad bacteria. Uh, bacteria that infected your throat, started reproducing, growing a colony in your throat, damaging the tissue, okay? making it red, irritated, and causing it to hurt. So what does the doctor generally give you in that case? Emma? An antibiotic. An antibiotic, which is a specific chemical that's designed to kill bacteria. So let's say you go, we have sore throat, they gag you with that giant Q-tip, yeah. culture it. They say, oh, you have, you have strep throat. It means you have streptococcus bacteria living in your throat. They write you a prescription for amoxicillin, that gross paste liquid. You know what I'm talking about? So, do you take it until you start to feel better and then throw it away? No. 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 So what are the instructions always given when you're on an antibiotic? Finish. Finish the full course. Because you take the antibiotic day one, okay, it doesn't do much. By day two, your throat starts feeling better. Now think about what's happening in your throat. You're exposing this population of bacteria to this chemical that's poisonous to them. Which bacteria die off in the first day or two? Okay. The ones that can't survive. Yeah, sort of the weakest ones, the ones that have no resistance. And so probably after two or three days, probably 90% of them are dead, and your throat doesn't hurt anymore. But they're not all dead. So what happens if you throw away, you say, okay, I feel better, I'm not taking this anymore. And what happens, Jeremy? And they'll keep on repopulating. Yeah, those ones that were left, which ones are still left after a few days? The strongest ones, the ones that are resistant. Well, you stop taking antibiotics, now they have a chance to start to grow again and reproduce. And then, a couple days later, your throat starts to hurt again. But this time, it's, the infection is worse. You go back to the doctor and they give you some more amoxicillin, probably it's not going to work on that infection. Because what did you do? You selected for the strongest and most resistant bacteria. Okay? And therefore, that population is going to be resistant. And that's why you take it off. Pretty much none of them are going to be able to survive a full 10 day course of antibiotics that you usually will take. Okay? Um, so you take it really because of natural selection. The same thing happens in insects and insecticides as well. Camouflage is a great example of. Adaptation, it's neat to look at examples of that. Many, many species have evolved to be camouflaged um, to avoid predators or sometimes to sneak up on their prey. Here's some examples. Look at this insect. Okay, the exact color of the petals of the flower it lives in. Or this owl. These are edicts. It's like a deer-like creature that lives in the um, Middle East. It's, um, oh my God. It, they live in dry, rocky conditions. You can see there's three of them. There's one here, sideways. One sort of face on right here, it's facing you. And then there's a third one, which I got closer to see. Oh, right there. Yeah. I can't see them. So there? Oh. No, we're going to do a lab on these moths. There's two peppered moths here, the dark version and the light version. Where's the light version? This is the light version. And here is the light version and the dark version. And we'll talk about... So that's kind of an adaption. Yes. No. No, why? Yep. What is that? Chameleon? Yeah. How can they change their body to that? 
Um, they have special sensors and um, pigments in their scales that can change. Even things like a household cat can be camouflaged. Which, which one is just a kind of same thing? Are you going to do the one that counts that timer? Not right now. See it? No. No. Pretty well yeah. here. Wow. We're going to talk about it. Some organisms even have evolved to look not look like another organism. It's called mimicry. Mimicry is when a species evolves to look like some other species. Sometimes it's to help attract prey. Other times it's to discourage predators. You know what kind of snakes this is. So this is a coral snake, deadly. Okay, can kill a person with a bite. Oh, that's fun. This is not a coral snake. Okay, although it looks quite similar, it's a scarlet king snake. It's not poisonous at all. So why? So this is mimicry. This scarlet king snake has evolved over time to have a similar coloration to the coral snake. Why? How is that a helpful adaptation, Richard? Yeah, most predators are not going to attack a coral snake. Okay. The king snake has mimicked its colors. Even though it has no poison, predators will avoid it because it looks similar to the coral snake. Tali is right, there's a saying to help you remember which is which. Red next to yellow, you're a dead fellow. Red next to black, you're safe, Jack. So you see, the red is next to the yellow in the coral snake. The red is next to the black. It's white, though. Yeah, it's white. It's really yellow, just the way the image is. This is what type of butterfly? Monarch. A monarch. They are poisonous because they eat milkweed. They, is, they um, incorporate some of the toxins from the sap of the milkweed plant into their bodies. Most predators are not going to eat monarchs. This is not a monarch. This is a viceroy. It has evolved to look quite similar to the monarch, again, to avoid predators. Dylan? Did you ever like, hear of uh, an octopus that can like, change its skin color and Oh, yes. yes I have. This is a bee orchid. Its petals, it's a flower, but its petals have adapted to have a coloration that makes it look sort of like a bee. Bees think it's another bee and attempt to mate with it, even though it's just a petal of a flower. And in the process, they get pollen on them and help to pollinate that plant. Okay. Whoa. What's that? I don't even These know. are caterpillars. What? 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 The what? end of a caterpillar has evolved to look like the head of a snake. Yes. I that's the end? That's a yes. That's not the front. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> Those aren't eyes. They're eye spots. They're just coloration on the exoskeleton of this insect to make it look a little scary. What's that? No. This is a moth. What? These are not legs. Those are just pigments. Those are patterns of color. You can see this is its wing. That's the wing. That's a moth. Are like butterflies that like have like an owl eye or something? Yeah, there's some of those as well. Isn't that like a spider with like a smiley face on it? It's a spider moth. Yeah, yeah there's all sorts of weird things. This is a swallowtail caterpillar that what? looks kind of like bird poop. Oh, yeah, it's so. a snail. A snail. Right? 
like a stick bug. There's all sorts of things. Lots of things mimic leaves. You can see the leaves of this plant. Then you can see this is the head of the insect. You can see its two antenna. This is its body. It looks just exactly the same shape and color as those leaves. Another insect. Obviously, this is all its body. This is the insect, not leaves. Head of it. Right. Yes, I don't know. How does that happen that the animals adapt to the part like they have? It starts off gradually. So, like if the, for example, if we, how do we get to this? So, you don't get from like a little thing that looks like a grasshopper to this, right, in a couple generations takes a long period of time. But imagine a caterpillar which is born with some sort of like mutation that makes its exoskeleton sort of wider. And maybe it looks just a little bit more like a leaf. That's going to convey an advantage. Even though it's like just a tiny little change, if it's helpful, it's going to be a little bit more likely to survive, a little bit more likely to reproduce, to pass on to its offspring, just this little variation. And then when that continues, generation after generation, anytime there's sort of a larger or a flatter or a greener extension of that exoskeleton, that's favored. And so these tiny little variations can become exaggerated over time, as long as they're healthy. All right. Let me, uh, uh, did we do this slide? Yeah. OK. Um, artificial selection, like the hypoallergenic cat. How would you have, how do we, how do people create dog breeds or cat breeds or whatever? Like where do they come from? They're all one species, Mateo. Wolves. Yeah, but like humans bred these cats to be furless. How do they do that? Are you? Don't they like breed two species? Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be two species. How would you do this? You want to make this cat? Well, I don't know. What do you do? So, like, I have a gold doodle. Yeah. So they t they take a retriever and they take a poodle and they put them in a cage and tell them to mate. <laughs> mate. <laughs> um, okay. That's not going to result in a hairless cat. Well, okay. How about a peanut? <laughs> no, no hair. Tell you. Like, shave all the hair off. Would that change its genes? No. 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 Emily? Like you said the cat would with the least amount of hair and then have it with the cat. Yeah, say you have whatever the origin species um breed of this cat is. You have a cat has a litter of kittens. Which one are you gonna select? Hairless. They're not gonna be hairless. The, the, least amount of hair. the ones that have the least amount of hair. And then from another litter, same thing. You take the cat that has the least amount of hair, and you take them together, as Dan would say, we put them in a cage, we say mate. <laughs> How about when they have kittens, then what do you do? Take the one with the least amount of hair, breed it together with another with the least amount of hair. If you repeat this many, many, many times, eventually it results in hairless cats, okay? Now, it's not natural selection, it's what we call artificial selection. Humans are choosing which can survive, which get told to mate. And over time, that can result in changes in the species. That's where modern dog species, they all came from one ancestor, but modern dog species are, have come about due to artificial selection. How could some get blonde if doesn't even look blonde? Because is there a variation in the wolves? Do some have slightly lighter fur? Yeah, but they're not going to become blonde. If you take the one that has slightly lighter fur, and you repeat that, you take the one on this breed that has slightly lighter fur, breed them together, what are they going to probably produce? Just a little bit lighter fur. But you continue that generation after generation, and it can result in big changes.